Thank you very much. We will get started. A few others are, are on the way, but I think we want to take full advantage of our time here with our special guest, Alejandro Katterberg, the co-founder and president of Poliarquia. Um, Alejandro, as, as many of you know, is one of Argentina's leading pollsters and political analysts, and as well a consultant for notable international and Argentine companies looking to understand better public opinion in Argentina. The title of this presentation here is ambitious, um, but I think we're in good hands in, in tracking the future of Argentina. Um, it's ambitious not only because obviously that, that's a pretty broad subject matter for a conversation of this variety, but also because Argentina is sort of infamously unpredictable and has been even more so over the last few years. Um, the election of President Mauricio Macri in late 2015 was not widely anticipated, although your polling, of course, helps us predict events such as that. Um, and then his presidency itself has been rather unpredictable. I think people take for granted more or less the trajectory of the last two years. But thinking back to the previous period, there was not only great skepticism that a non perinist would win an election in Argentina, even following the tumultuous years of Cristina Fernandez de Kirchner, but that despite the politically treacherous reforms that have gone on over the last few years, including some very unpopular reductions in subsidies that have increased dramatically the cost of heating homes and riding subways and trains in Argentina, that President Macri has maintained an approval rating more or less around 50 percent. That's extraordinarily high for the region, but notably high in Argentina, given that the first year of his government involved an extraordinary increase in inflation and a recession and growth has resumed, but at a relatively low rate, and inflation still remains over 20%. So given those indicators and the politically difficult reforms, I think it's been quite extraordinary that, that President Macri has maintained the approval he has and has demonstrated the governability um, that many thought was impossible, given the lack of congressional majorities and, again, given the difficult macroeconomic conditions that President Macri inherited. So with that said, the reform program itself and President Macri's political standing have come into some question in the more recent period. So there was exuberance for those who support these reforms in Argentina following the midterms in October of last year. Um, that exuberance did not last very long. And so with the new political capital that President Macri had accumulated, he pursued a very unpopular pension reform that he succeeded in passing, again, forming ad hoc coalitions in the Argentine Congress. This was a closely watched and important reform, important to, among other things, reducing the fiscal deficit that has contributed to the inflation phenomenon. However, it was quite costly. And I think we'll get into the specific numbers, but I think the reduction, more or less, in the public approval rating was in the order of 13, 14 points in just a two, three month period, which called into question the viability of the next series of reforms in particular the labor reforms, which are arguably the most important and closely watched of the remaining reforms for Macri's only or first term, depending on how things go, and we'll learn how things will go shortly in the 2019 election. So that is more or less the um, framework that we will explore here um, and some of the new broader political dynamics that have been introduced and are um, appear to be consolidating, but again, with great unpredictability that relates in part to phenomena outside the hands of the president in terms of the opposition and its own process of consolidation. Let me um, briefly introduce the um, broader context here at the Wilson Center, which is, I am Benjamin Gadan. I am a public policy fellow at the Wilson Center. This event is brought to you by the Argentina Project, a new initiative of the Latin American program here at the Wilson Center that is dedicated to the study of precisely these, these phenomena in Argentina, this historic political and economic reform process, um, and providing the sorts of expertise and knowledge that um, companies that are interested in investing in Argentina, the United States government, the Argentine government engaging in these reforms, and other diplomats and journalists and actors who are rediscovering Argentina after a long period where it was not quite at the center of conversation in Washington, at least as it is now. So with that, I'm going to have Alejandro provide a bit of a presentation and some of his insights and analysis. Then I'm going to return to ask a few of my own questions, and then we'll, as quickly as possible, involve you in the conversation. Thank you very much for coming, and please join me in thanking Alejandro Katterberg for being here with us. Thank you, Benjamin. I, I will move here. It's, as, as, thank you very much. Benjamin, for having me here and, and, and the Wilson Center. It's really a, a pleasure and an honor to be here. And 
I have a, a, a long presentation. I, I will not go through the whole of it. I, I will use it probably to answer or to show some evidence uh, of the of the question Benjamin and, 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 and you may ask. I, I just want to focus on three broader things or, or three topics to, to talk about it. The first one is to understand and try to explain how macro-political power has been consolidating over the last two years and how this process, in my opinion, is still growing and has a very high probability of keep growing. Uh, so to go from a very weak beginning, uh, where basically uh, the in political terms and in economic terms, the, the, the situation of, of the administration was very fragile to the political power uh, that Macri and the government now has nowadays. The second topic will be to understand, or not to understand, to think what elements are different this time in Argentina. And that was triggered by a question I received a few weeks from uh, one of the clients, uh, a, a company that were thinking about Argentina and, and trying to decide investments in Argentina for the long term. And basically they were quite skeptical or, or, or they were asking uh, why this time will be different to the previous time in Argentina. So uh, I have identified a number of things that, are, that, that have the potential to, to create a different story this time and, and I want to share with you my thought regarding that. And the third topic will be about uh, two early predictions about next year election. Uh, what is the scenario and, and, and what we are seeing from here. So let me start with, with the first point and, 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 and this is what we were saying about Macri getting stronger. First of all, I won't get into the many details about this, but how the economic has a strength over the last two years from the very critical situation that Macri heritage with the first round of reforms that he did it just in the beginning, normalizing the economy, uh, making the agreement with the holdouts, uh, putting a independent central banks, changing the statistic agency, uh, and little by little, investment is growing, GDP has started to grow over the last year, uh, inflation with later and, and, and more slowly than the, pro the, the own government expected, but it's, it's going down. Yeah. Uh, and that gives the government m bigger degrees of freedom and, and a, a much more solid position to start working on a second round of reforms and agenda than what they had in the first year. And probably the, one of the most important elements that Macri had during the first two years is the help, or <laughs> if you want to put it in one word, uh, of the international markets willing to finance this gradualism that the administration has chosen uh, in order not to make very tough uh, fiscal decisions from the beginning. The second thing was the impressive midterm election victory that Macri had. Uh, only comparable in the last 30 years with the 1985 midterm election of Alfonsino, the 1993 midterm election of Menem. Uh, and that election that happened last year basically had, in my opinion, three important consequences. Number one, it changed the expectation and the perception of very important political actors, especially Peronist leaders, Peronist governors, Peronist union leaders, but also investors, business guys, businessmen, et cetera, et cetera. To put it in a very simple way, many of these actors, especially some sector of the Peronists, were seeing a totally different picture last year. They were, expe they, 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 were, they were expecting a defeat of Macri in the election, and they thought that the society was going to be uh, tough on, Ma of, on Macri because of the uh, reforms and especially because of the uh, reduce reduction of subsidies, etc., etc., etc. And basically, they took them by surprise how huge the victory was, and the fact that Macri party was able to defeat many of these Peronists in their own provinces. Uh, so in, in, in a very simply way, from many of these guys, the perception went from being 
let's see if Macri is able to complete his tenure to this guy is going to be here the next six years. That was how dramatically changed the perception of Macri's strengths af after the victory. The second important consequence of that election was, of course, the Congress. We knew before the election that it was going to be impossible for Cambiemos to get a majority in the Congress, but they were able to double the number of senators and they were able to become the first minority in the House, uh, increasing more than 22 seats, the number of deputies they have. And that is very helpful. The third element is the shock that he received in public opinion terms. During the four-month campaign that we have, because basically we have two months dedicated to the national primary and then we have other two months dedicated to the general election, Macri popularity and all of the different indicators that we measure in, in our national surveys went up very sharply. We, if, I, if I have time, I, uh, I will show you. And that was important because that helped the government, not only the victory, but having this new round of very high public opinion support to go and push for a, ne a new rounds of reform that happened uh, during December last year. The third thing that is also consolidating Macri power, of course, is the crisis within the Peronists. That is getting deeper and deeper and deeper. Uh, and of course, it's always very helpful to run a country when the opposition is totally divided and fighting each other. Uh, and basically, the very few times that the opposition managed to get together and attack Macri when the government made some mistake or the government was pushed to, for example, do the uh, the, the pension reform that helped many of the different sectors of the Peronists to, to attack the government. But basically, if the government uh, step up aside of the debate in the public agenda and they let alone the Peronists, basically what happened is that instead of trying to improve and find solutions or, or trying to move forward, the Peronists are still fighting each other, getting more divided. On the last few months, we have started to see some movements uh, from different players in the Peronist party to try to find a solution or get together, I'm very skeptical about this. Uh, I, w I will talk to that later when we talk about the 2018 election, but of course the, 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 the amount of crisis, crisis there is, is, is huge. Second, the unions. Uh, I think probably the most important political news that happened this summer in Argentina, besides the reform of December, is the confrontation that happened during February between the government and Moyano. And it was very clear that if we have to mention a winner in that battle, it was the government. And it was clear, and, and, a, a, and a consequence of that situation was that after two years of Macri administration, now we have a divided uh, confederation of unions. After two years, uh, Moshano is getting together with uh, extreme left union leaders, but the more moderate uh, union leaders that represent uh, private sectors uh, are negotiating and collaborating with the government. Uh, fifth, growing influence over the judicial branch. That's a key element in Argentinian politics. Sometimes it's hard to explain it or, or people outside, from outside, they, they don't fully understand how much influence and damage can a sector of the judicial uh, sector uh, create in the governability and, 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 in, and, and, in the, and, and in the popular support for a government or for a politician. And little by little, uh, Macri is expanding its influence or, or, or trying to have at least uh, some damage control of things that could happen there. To give you an example, just one week before the midterm election and after two years of trying to get rid of the general attorney, Macri was able to uh, get rid of Gilles Carbo, uh, and now he's in the process of nominating a new general attorney. And that's important. If, if you don't have someone that from your own party or, or someone at least independent that is that's not reborn uh, ideological to, to the previous administration running the criminal policy in your country, that's one of the examples. And finally, as I said before, uh, public opinion support over these years. Uh, of course, a little bit extra after the election, but so far, as Mekha Mikhail says, Macri popular 
support has been around 50%, 50-52% over the last two years. Uh, his worst number was 42-44 percentage in February last year in the middle of a, uh, a, uh, the crisis with the, remember, with the post company associated with his family. Uh, the best number, if we take away the honeymoon of the first 100 days, was in November last year after the election. It was 62%. Between 40 and 62%, that was all of the uh, changes we have over the last four years. Basically, we have a solid 40% of the population who consistently support the administration. We have a solid 14% of the population who consistently reject the administration. In the middle, so far, we have had 20% of the people who sometimes they are supporting the measurements, sometimes they are against. But it's not only Macri. When you look at the, at, uh, at the surveys, at the popularity of the politicians, within the top 10 politicians in the country, you have nine that belong to Cambiemos. Uh, when you look at the parties, Cambiemos has a, as a branch uh, has uh, very favorable numbers much better than the Kirchnerismo or the Peronismo or even the Radicalismo. So public opinion support has been key and is still uh, on, on Macri's side. A few numbers, but part of the same thing, and, and, and if, if it's needed, I, I, I will get there during the question. But this is very important. Remember this, Macri got 34% in the presidential election in 2015. Remember Argentina law. You need 45% at the national uh, level, at, uh, if you're running for president, to win in the first round and to avoid the second round, or a difference between 10 points if you get something between 40 to 45. Macri got 34. Then in the, in the primaries at the national level, he got 37. In the October election, he went to 42. And this is key, because they were able to get 42% of the votes in a midterm election, when generally for a legislative election, the vote is more fragmented than in an executive election, and without Macri and Vidal or Larreta on the ticket. And remember that in Argentina, we vote with paper ballots that basically they are all attached. So when we have governor election and congressional election and president election, you have first the picture of the president, then the governor, then the other people, and uh, other people running for, for different things. And when people go on vote, they just pick one ballot. It's very, very few the number of the occasions where people decide to vote for one as the president and then as the governor. What happened in Buenos Aires province in 2015 was one of the very few occasions when you have a big number of people voting one way for one thing and the other way for the other. So if you take in consideration that that was a midterm election and that neither Macri, Vidal, or Larreta were on the ballot, Bullrich was on the ballot, they already got the 45% they needed, okay? So this is an important number, I'm gonna get there. This is the evolution of the number of provinces where Cambiemos won over the last two years. Here you can see it more clearly in the map. Yellow is the, the color of Cambiemos. This is how Cambiemos is expanding its influence uh, around the country. It started with Buenos Aires City, it went from Buenos Aires City to Buenos Aires Province, now it's, it's this. And this is something about Buenos Aires province itself. Uh, I don't have time to talk about it, but it, 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 it's, it's quite, in my opinion, crucial. To put it, a, just open a, a, a remark. If Argentina happens to be a successful story and the change is permanent, and in six, eight years from now, we look forward and we see, wow, how Argentina was able to make this change, I see in the beginning of all that, we have to go and look at it in Buenos Aires province. The fact that the Peronists lost Buenos Aires province uh, is, 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 in my opinion, the, one of the most relevant things that happened in 2015. It's, it, is, it is not that unusual that we have non-Peronist president. It's, it's very quite unusual that we have non-Peronist governor of Buenos Aires province. Okay? Uh, this, was, this is how the Senate and the Congress look like now today. Second topic. Why this time could be different? I don't know if it's going to be different, but I, I, I think there are a few elements to believe that this time could be different. First, new kids on the block. Uh, really, 
the guys, 90% of the people running this country, uh, this country, no, <laughs> well, this country also, <laughs> but 90% of the people who's running Argentina, 10 days, 10, 10, 10 years ago, they were out of politics. In the US, it could be the same, right? but they did not belong to the traditional political members of the radical and peronist matrix that has been the whole life part of the, of, of, or, or, or living or, or, or doing political career or living uh, at the cost of the state. They are, these guys are new guys. Uh, they have a past in the private sector. They are pro-market, pro-globalization. Uh, they are quite pragmatical. They are focused on management, less focused on ideological issues. Uh, and I think that's probably the, the key thing that we are now have a new group of people that basically is the consequences of the 2001 and two big crisis in Argentina that started to decide to get involved. But these guys are now running the country and they are not Peronists, they are not radicals. They are something new. Uh, second, something new that is also happening is that we have tend to move from one way of the spectrum to the other. So that's one of the things I always say of Argentina. Well, we were here, the, and Argentina then, a decade later, went all of the other way. And generally what happened, the thing that have moved Argentina from one way to the other in the past, it was some kind of explosion. An economic big crisis, a uh, military coup d'etat, but something a big event basically has exploded here and moved the pendulum all, of the, all, the, all the way to the other side. This time is different because we didn't have an explosion. Things were very close to explode, uh, but it didn't happen. And the society didn't perceive it. And that's one of the reasons why society is not willing to accept uh, deep reforms, because they did not, saw, they did not see uh, the, 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 the crisis unfolding. That is the basis of gradualism. I think gradualism, will not, it, it was not a, a decision of the government. It was the only option at the time they, they got there. Not only because they were, they were weak in political terms and they did not have the control of the Congress, not, they did not have the, the support or control of the unions, uh, only have five governors out of 24 in Argentina, but because society was not ready for it. They will not accept it. They could have not accepted it. So, this time, instead of going from one point to the, uh, to the extreme other one, we are in the middle. It's, it's something new that these guys are trying. Instead of trying to recover on a B-shape, Maxi here knows a lot about this, we are trying to, to, to recover in, in a very uh, slow and constant uh, matter. It's not about growing uh, too fast. It's about growing for too long. And this is also news in Argentina. When you look at the volatility of Argentinian economy, I think it must be the top 10 of the countries uh, over the last 50 years. Third, related to what I said about the new guys, we are seeing a total reconfiguration of the political parties in Argentina. Argentinian political parties have traditionally been for, for someone coming from outside Argentina, the, the first question was, well, can you explain me the Peronists? Who party is the center-right? Who party is the center-left? It, it was tough to get it. Basically, the two main parties in Argentina were not divided on the horizontal axis, left and right, but divided on the vertical axis. Upper middle class or middle class and upper middle class were basically, to put it in a very simple way, the voters of the radical party. Lower middle class, working class, were the voters of the Peronist party. But within the Radical Party and the Peronist Party, you have left, center, and right. Just to look at the last four, the, the presidents we have since the return of democracy. Alfonsín was someone from the upper left. It was followed by Menem, uh, down right. It was followed by De La Rúa, upper right. And it was followed by Kirchner, down left. That was... Then what happened, basically, after the crisis in 2001 and 2002, the Radical Party disappeared. They disappeared as a national option. It's not longer a national alternative. It remained as some influential in some provinces, 
and in the Congress uh, having each time less amount of members in the Congress, but still uh, a number important enough to be needed to make coalitions. But without one of the reasons the Kirchner were able to do whatever they wanted, it was because not only because Argentina was growing 8% a year, but because in front of them there was nothing. When Cristina Kirchner got 54% of the vote, that was huge. But the surprising thing was that the second and almost 40 points behind her, when the second should have had 38, 40% of the vote. That allowed them to say her, now we go for everything. Now vamos por todo. So Without the Radical Party, basically Cambiemos, or, or Pro, Macri himself, is openly a center-right candidate, or a center-right politician, who has got to power with the vast majority of what it used to be the radical voters, especially the center to the right radical voters. But now they are switching, and they are moving, and they are trying to get into Peronist territory. And that's one of the strategies the government is doing. And there is a debate between, I, within the government because some are complaining, and we can see over the news in the last two or three weeks, the radicals and, and Carrió complaining about that the cost of gaining support of the tradi or some of traditional Peronist voters, lower class, uh, mi lower middle class, working class voters, is at the cost is at the, at the expense of the middle class or the upper middle class. So the radicals are complaining and say, be careful. Maybe we are pushing too far the, the, the tension within our own voters. And many people, it's, it's unhappy because basically they are paying more tariff, they are paying more taxes, uh, and they don't receive anything on return in their view. But that's what is going on. The other thing that is going on is that the crisis within the Peronist party and Cristina Kirchner moving clearly to the left. One thing that happened in Argentina is that we have a new left. The, the, the traditional left parties that represent 5% or, or always get 5% of the votes, now they're getting, they're going to get between 50 to 20% of the vote because the Kirchner are there. And when you look what happened in December, the coordination between the left parties and, and, and the Kirchneristas is there. And basically, uh, I, I will get there later, the identity of the Cristina party is basically related to traditional values of the radical left and the Peronist left. Let me get there. But the, all, the other element we're seeing is the Peronist party, the PJ, potentially following the same path that the radical had over the last decade, from be being a national party to maybe just becoming a party with relevance in the provinces, uh, but without being uh, fundamental at the, at, at the national competitions. That's an hypothesis, but when you look at what is going on, the, the clear division and confrontation is between Cambiemos, the pro-party, and Cristina, and that is still working. I will have to accelerate. One more thing, a generational change in political leadership, not only within the government, but also in the opposition. We are having a new generation of politicians get into power. And probably this, will, this is the first generation of politicians from now on that they did not grow up during the 30 years of the 70s, during the, they don't have a vision of the, uh, the bipolar war, the left Peronists fighting the right Peronists. They have traveled abroad. Alfonsín never traveled before becoming president. Kishner never was outside the country before becoming president, even Menem. This new generation in the government, but even in the opposition, they have a totally different view about the world, about the economy. They are a little bit more pragmatical. Uh, uh, they were educated during democracy. Most of their life it was spent during democracy. And nowadays you have a lot of 40-something guys running the country, starting with Mario Eugenia Vidal, 44 years old, Marcos Peña, 40 years old, Frigerio, Salvay, Dietrich, I can keep mentioning it, and people in the opposition, the guys who write economic laws in the, in the Congress, Luciano Laspina, 40-something, Marco Lavagna, 40 sample, Diego Bosio, 40, etc., etc., etc. That is also going on. That's new. I don't know if it's positive, negative, but that's new. 
A fifth thing, the government has the national government, the province of Buenos Aires government, and the city of Buenos Aires government. And it's not only that they have it because the Peronists have it in the past, but in the last 20 years, there was not collaboration between the Peronists in the Buenos Aires province and the Peronists at the in Casa Rosada. Basically, they were the internal enemies. That happened between Dualde and Menem, and that happened between Scioli and Cristina Kirchner. These guys are, are different. They're collaborating. Just in, uh, as an example, in the first year, Macri solved the uh, traslado, the sending the, the uh, federal police force to Buenos Aires City. That has not been done in the last 15 years, and it should have been done. Last year, Macri solved the Fondo de Conurbano issue. He was willing to give Mario Eugenia Vidal almost 100 billion pesos for the next two years. And that, in my opinion, will be one of the keys to understand the consolidation of Cambiemos if it happens next year. Because basically, in the, in, in the suburbs of Buenos Aires City, you have almost one third of the population of Argentina. And they're going to make reforms there in a coordinating way between Buenos Aires City, the national government, and the Buenos Aires uh, province government. And you have almost 50% of the poverty of Argentina living there. So if they are successful in implementing those changes and those reform and those and infrastructure there, the chances of winning the election will, will be higher. Public opinion support, we mentioned about that. Public expenditure, one more thing. This is, a, this is new also in Argentina, it's different. I, I know, I'm not saying it's good or but it's probably bad. Argentina public expenditure to GDP have moved during the Kirchner years from an average of 28% to higher than 40%. That's a very heavy backpack for the private sector and probably one of the most important reasons Argentina economy is not able to move forward quickly. But that's a huge opportunity for Cambiemos because basically that big, big state that now Cambiemos controls will allow them to maintain the welfare uh, programs, the subsidies to poor people, and to make some kind of revolution in the infrastructure. So basically, if Cambiemos, if Cambiemos is efficient enough, transparent enough, and they don't take uh, decisions towards the changes in, in social and, 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 and physical infrastructure based on political conveniences of doing this to and sending this money or this project to this province because of political reasons, they have a very good chance of making some kind of big revolutionary changes in the social and, and physical infrastructure of the country. I think they are betting on that and they have a lot of money to do it because they heritage that big, big state that the Kirchner had. Something else that is different this time. Argentina is moving forward in a modernization process, a modernization of the economy, the political, the, so the society, but no one from outside is pushing in that way. It's not that we have the IMF or it's not that we have the Washington consensus of the 90s, it's not that we have uh, the, 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 the pushing of the uh, uh, White House during the Cold War. Macri and Argentina, it's not only Macri, is, is moving forward with modernization reforms, getting involved into the, in, into the world, uh, doing pro-market reforms, because they want it. There is no one pushing it. And that's also new. Every time we did it in the past, there was someone there saying, you have to go this way. Macri can pull the brake, go the other way, and no one will say nothing. There is no external restriction to doing that. And finally, more transparency. Not because Macri wanted, I guess he wanted, and, and, and of course I, I, I think uh, the levels of transparency that this government and this administration has are much, much higher than what we have seen in the past. But because of the world is changing, and because you have Odebrecht, because you have Panama Papers, Paradise Papers, WikiLeaks, because anyone can take a picture, because I was outside there and, 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 and had lunch and tried to pay with a hundred dollar bill and they say, wow, 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 they were about to call the police. What are you doing with a hundred dollar bills? So what are they going to do, the corrupt politicians in Argentina? Keep putting 
cash on, on, on bags and, and wh where are they going to spend it? And the international system is becoming harder and harder and harder. So not only for Argentina, for the whole Latin America that we are seeing huge corruption scandal around, I think it's, 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 it's becoming harder and harder and harder uh, to be corrupt. And that's one of the most important issues in Argentina. And I think that is changing also. Finally, I don't know ben, I mean, how much time we have. Uh, five more minutes? Uh, two things. People can vote for a party because that party is associated with values, with identity. People had vote here and there and everywhere for the Republican Party because it's just the Republican Party and whoever the candidate is, you have an important number of people voting for the Republican or you used to have an important number of people voting for the Peronist or the Radical depending independently of who the candidate was. People can vote for a candidate because they like the candidate, because he has charisma and because he promised everything to everybody, etc., etc. The thing is, Right now in Argentina, in my opinion, we have three different political forces. We have Macrism, we have Cristina, or Kirchnerism, and we have the Peronists. Macrism has a very clear identity. People know what they stand for, they know their values, what they wanted, what they don't want. The same happened with the Kirchnerism. Macrism has a very clear leadership in Mauricio Macri, who will be running for re-election. Uh, Kirchnerism has a very clear leadership in Cristina Kirchner. Macrism has one advantage over the Kirchnerism, is that they have potential successors inside their coalition, starting with Mario Eugenia Vidal, the most popular politician in Argentina. Cristina doesn't have anyone. She has Kisilov, Rossi. <laughs> they won't get her. Peronism, the Peronist party, doesn't have anything. So I don't really understand why people will vote for the Peronist Party, because nowadays they don't represent anything. It's an empty box. It's an empty box. And they don't have leadership. Well, they used to have Massa. Massa is suffering a lot and has suffered a lot over the last few years. They lack of coordination. They lack of resources. You need resources. And by losing Buenos Aires province, now the main and by losing the national government, the main two origin of their resources to running campaigns are gone. They lack of coordination, etc., etc., etc. They lack of ideas of, of offering something new to the to, to, to the public. And basically, what is going on is Christina Kirchner has took the flag, the, the value of the left radicals, as I was saying, up and, and, and down. And what was that? Human rights. The human rights agenda no longer are as, is associated with the radical party. Human rights agenda is associated with the Kirchnerism. And from the left Peronists, she, she took the uh, social justice agenda and the uh, el nacionalismo popular, the national populism or popular nationalism. So the Peronists, the only thing they have left is the governability issue, but Macri is taking away that from them. Remember one thing, Macri administration is going to be the first non-Peronist government since Peron was born, or not was born, but since Peron took office, to be able to complete its mandate. As Benjamin said, the, the first year the question about Argentina was about governability. Who are these guys? How are they going to run a country where non-Peronist government has never able to complete its administration over the last 70 years. Well, Macri is going to be the first one, and probably he will be reelected. Okay? So that's the problem with the Peronism right now. I don't see how they're going to find a solution because I still see a big part of the society that strongly rejects this government that feeling much more closer to Cristina than to the traditional Peronist leaders. Basically, to put it in a way, these are totally subjective probabilities. I think there is a very huge chance that this administration is reelected. Why? To put it in simple ways. I remember the 42% they got last year. They need only 3% more of what they got last year. As, as Benjamin said, in the first two years, they were the toughest years of the administration. 60% inflation rate, uh, real salaries going down, consumption going down, 
uh, Brazil having the worst two crises of, of, of the last, the worst two years of the last 100 years, uh, public works not ready being in, in place. If you took with many people in, in, in the administration, they basically said, look, the next two years for sure are going to be better than the previous two years. In the next two years, we're going to have lower inflation than what happened, most importantly and most crucially. In the second part of my administration, tariff increase will be 10% of the tariff increase in the first two years. In the first two years, they have like 600% six, increase. Now they're having 40, 45, and we have only one more round of really tough increases in tariff. So without big increases in tariff, with inflation going down a little bit, with all of the public works that the government is pushing and the PPP that we have to wait until Friday to see if how successful they are, but they are very optimistic that they're going to be uh, very successful in, in, in all of the uh, private and public projects that are planning for, for next year. With all of that, the government says how we are not going to be able to get 3% more of the votes with Mario Genia in the ticket, with Macri in the ticket, with Larrette in the key ticket, and with many of the uh, Cambiemos governors in the ticket. And that's quite reasonable. They only need to grow 3% more of what they got last year. If that happened, Macri will be reelected in the first round. He will get the majority in the House, not in the Senate, and probably he will be able, I don't know if 12 is too optimist, but right now they have five governors. If everything goes well, they are in a position to win four or five extra governors at the national level, starting with Santa Cruz, uh, maybe Cordoba. We have to see what happened there. I don't want to get into detail, but it's going to be a very solid victory for Macri. What has to happen in order for Macri to lose the election? And that will be the third scenario. Under a context of nothing strange going on, and, and by fin then I will tell you what are the, the very strange things that could happen that change everything. But if nothing big happened and Argentina have a 2.5 growth this year, 3, 3.5 growth next year, I think we are talking about this situation. Well, what, what could happen there? First, the first thing that has to happen is Macri not getting to 45% of the vote. So things doesn't have to go very well. Inflation maybe is a little bit higher. Macri suffers some popularity issues, et cetera, et cetera. Let's suppose that Macri, instead of having 45, 47% of the votes, he gets 41, 40, 42, the same as last year. The second thing that has to happen, in my opinion, is that you cannot have an agreement between the whole Peronists. If you have an agreement between the whole Peronists trying to confront and defeat Macri, that will benefit Macri. Why? Let me try to be very briefly in, in explaining this. Argentine society is clearly divided in three groups. You have people who totally hate Cristina, they don't like the Peronists, and they tend to agree with Macri and Cambiemos view about the economy, the world, etc., etc. Typically, middle class, urban middle class, upper middle class from Argentinian cities. Okay, that used to that is around 35, 37, 40 percent of Argentine population. On the other extreme, you have people who totally hate Macri, who are very close identified with Cristina, and some of them maybe they don't like Cristina, but they hate Macri and they support extreme left parties, like the Communist Party, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And that, when you put together the Kirchneristas plus the extreme left, you have around 30% of Argentine population. Remember that Cristina still have between 25 and 30% strong support over the last year and a half. Uh, and in the middle, you have the middle, the independent voters, the people who doesn't care that much about politics, people who doesn't read news, uh, basically, people who vote based on what is going on with the economy or how good or bad the, the services that they are receiving for this, from, from the state. Every time Macri won an election so far, he has to go to a second round. And every time he went to a second round, it was against a Cristina candidate. So the first time he won the Buenos Aires city, it was Macri against a Cristina candidate, he, they had to go to a second round. The vast majority of the people in the middle vote for Macri in the runoff. 
Four years later, in 2011, again was Macri against a Cristina candidate, the vast majority of the people in the middle, in the runoff, vote for Macri. 2015 was the same thing. Macri against Scioli, even though he lost the first round, the vast majority of the people who vote for Massa, Margarita Stolvitzer, and other more moderate candidates, they vote for Macri, and that's why he won the presidency. The only time he didn't have to face that situation was the election in Buenos Aires City in 2015. Remember, Mauricio Macri candidate was Larreta, Cristina candidate was Recalde, and the guy in the middle was Martin Lustó. You know him, the former Argentine ambassador here in the US. This time, the guy in the middle finished in the second place and defeat the Kirchnerista and has to face Macri candidate in the second round. In the first round, the Macri candidate got 47% of the votes. In the Buenos Aires city, you don't need 45, you need 50. Lustó got 26% of the votes. Everybody was saying this election is over. Even more, many people were asking Lustó to withdraw from the race. Do you know how that race ended up? From 47, 26, it went to 51, 49. That could have caused Macri the presidency. And what happened? All of the people here, they vote for the guy in the middle because they will prefer anyone except Macri. So going back to what I was saying, if the Kirchner and the Peronists get together, let's say again that Macri doesn't win in the first round, getting 45% of the vote because the economic situation is not doing well, et cetera, et cetera. They have 40% 40, 40 of the votes. Well, then many people in the middle will not like the picture of Urtubey or Massa with Maximo Kirchner and Kisilov. The Kirchner are a black hole. So everything that gets close to them becomes part of the black hole. So it's what will happen in that situation is that you will have some moderate independent people willing to vote for Macri, even though the economic conditions are not well, because they will get far away from the Kirchner. So with, with just 5% of the 30, 35% of the people in the middle voting for Macri because they don't like it, Massa, Urtubey, Randazzo, or the moderate Peronists getting together with Maximo Kirchner, Kisilov, Moshano, and Cristina Kirchner, that will be enough for Macri. So for that reason, and um, because of political reasons, I don't see and I don't expect a unity of the whole thing getting together. So what should have to happen is that basically, let's suppose Macri gets 41% of the votes, Cristina doesn't run and support Rossi Kisilov and Magario as a governor in Buenos Aires province, and Rossi Kisilov gets 18, 20% of the votes because always they will get less, a much less percent of votes than if Cristina runs. And then you have to suppose that the rest of the Peronists, they go to a primary they find a unity and we have a candidate that is able to get, let's say, 32, 33% of the votes. And that's not impossible at all. So if we end up having Macri with 41, 42%, a moderate Peronist getting 33, 32% of the vote, less than 10 point difference, and Christi not Cristina, but the Kirchneristas plus the extreme left having 25% of the votes or 20, well, then we have a very close second round because all of the people here will vote for this guy. So the strategy for the moderate Peronists is to get into the second round, but not with the Kirchner. They have, they, they, they will, if they win, they will win the, with the Kirchner votes, but not with the Kirchner uh, leaders, okay? And remember one more thing, next year is not only about presidential election. It's not the case that Cristina can withdraw from the race and said, okay, I'm supporting the Peronist candidate because we elect half of the House, one third of the Senate, uh, Provincial Congress, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And guys like Maximo Kirchner have to run for re-election. Guys like Kisilov, Cuervo La Roque, uh, Guado de Pedro, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All these guys are gonna run, and all these guys cannot get together with, in my opinion, with the moderate Peronists. So that will be the scenario where you can get this. How Christina can be able to come back, I'm not quite sure. Because if everything goes wrong, 
then we have the same thing going on, on the opposite side. If everything goes wrong and let's say uh, there is a big crisis and market popularity goes down, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, and we have two different peronists getting into the second round, then what is left of the people hating Cristina will prefer the moderate peronists in order to avoid Cristina to come back. Okay, you follow me? So if if it says it's Urtube Massa against Cristina, well, people here will prefer Urtube Massa. And if it's Macri against Urtube Massa, people here will prefer Urtube Massa. Okay? So to end up, what are the things that, in my opinion, could change this very positive scenario for Cambiemos? There are, in my opinion, three main factors quite evident. The first one is if we have some kind of external economic shock. Sudden stop of inflows, and Caputo goes up to the market, and the market says, I'm sorry, Caputo, it's not because of you, it's because things have changed, and the macrogradualism is over. So then we have a different game. And the other two things I'm worried about is uh, two political internal factors. So one ex external economic factor, two political economic factors. One is a direct attack to the macro credibility coming from corruption allegations, real or, or, or not real, but pushing by what I call the dark side of politics. That's the dirty network between former intelligence agencies, federal judges, uh, corruption sectors, et cetera, et cetera. Or you can have a direct effect toward macro credibility, not related to corruption, but related to something else. A few weeks ago in Argentina, we have an example of that that could trigger. In Brazil, they secretly record uh, Temer uh, in, a, in, a, uh, in an interview. In Argentina, we are hearing all weeks the private conversation between Cristina Kirchner and his closest advisor. Someday, we're going to start hearing the private conversation of Macri and some of his closest advisors. So that's a risk. And the other thing that could change everything is if we have some kind of crisis within Cambiemos, I don't think the radical party could do anything, even if they complain. I'm a little bit more worried about Carriza, Elisa Carrió. Last week, Elisa Carrió went to the television and said, well, there are two Macri's, the good Macri and the bad Macri. So far, the good Macri is beating the bad Macri. She can go to the television next week and said, well, now the bad Macri is beating, and I'm not with him. So if this happened, of course, the victor in the first round is out of the possibility. And if you don't have a victor in the first round, well, then it's not that clear that uh, they can win. Then there are some other minus factors. I'm a little bit concerned about public opinion, especially about expectations. And that was key, because when you look at public opinion numbers, basically, and when you look at how people say the economy is doing in the country, how the country is doing in generally, that not correlate with the amount of vote that the government got, and that does not correlate with the level of public support that Macri has. And the key is expectations. People said that the country, there is less than 20% of people still saying that the country is not, it's only 20% is saying they are doing well. You have 80% of the people saying that the country is not doing, it's doing so-so, or directly, you have like 40% of the people saying the conditions in the country are negative. But then Macri used to have more than 55% of the people saying, but we are going to do better in the future. Next year, things are going to be better. And that expectation has been falling down very dramatically over the last two or three months. So the key to understand the result of Macri and the deviation up from current conditions toward public support and votes is expectations. And if the expectation go down, well, then Macri has a problem or the administration has a problem. So we are running out of time. Uh, let's go to the questions and, and, uh, and, and I can show you then some part of public opinions or, or things if you think it. Thank you. Excellent. That was extraordinary as always. Thank you so much. You. Didn't leave much for us to explore, but um, we will use our remaining time to go in a bit of more detail on some of the subjects that you raised. I wanted to just start, and we'll very quickly get to your questions, with this uh, strategy in Buenos Aires province. 
So, I mean, this is clearly the area where the government thinks that it's going to get these three or more points that it may need in the future, even at the cost of alienating some of the upper middle class and the middle class. Um, this is You see this with this new, somewhat surprising plan to privatize and then redistribute some of the land in the Vichas and the shanty towns. You see this with this what seems to be a real focus on uh, uh, pobreza cero and this idea of reducing poverty and investing resources in that. I guess my question for you is, is this a realistic strategy or is this learning the wrong lesson from 2015, which many consider to have been a fluke victory for Maria Eugenio Vidal? Yes, in your polling, she's one of the most popular politicians around, but there's a real sense that she won because of the extraordinarily bad candidate that she faced, who was at the time suspected of involvement in, in three murders, and this was the major narrative in the campaign, and very closely allied with the unpopular president. So to the extent that this was a, a fluke victory by the candidate from the president's party, and to the extent that the historic domination and continued domination of, of most of Buenos Aires at the more local level by the Peronists, is this a, a serious and, and sane strategy for Macri to be pursuing to get the votes he needs? Yes, I, I think it is. And I think probably the main focus will be the great Buenos Aires area. Uh, and basically, remember that in the great Buenos Aires area is where they got the less amount of votes in 2015 and in 2017. So that's where you have the most potential capacity to grow. And they will go for it. And I think at the end of the day, you have to understand that Cambiemos, not Cambiemos Pro, Macri, they are not they don't see themselves as the uh, continuity of the radical party. They see themselves as something different. And in my opinion, they will go and try to get the lower middle class votes that are much easier to, con co to conquer than some of the ideological middle class votes of the Buenos Aires city that they were never able to conquer. Because to, it's not an ideolo ideological thing that this lower middle class has. It's just you will conquer her, them by providing them with public services, public infrastructure, uh, and, or the economy growing and getting better, or the inflation going down, or them being able to access to credit, etc., uh, etc., etc. Et Probably one of the most important political things that happened during the reforms in December was that with all of those things, uh, as we mentioned, now Maria Eugenia Vidal has a new, fresh, big amount of money to spend in the next year and a half. And by doing so, uh, I think they, they, they're going to be able to, to get that. The other thing that is true, over the last three or four months, Cambiemos support went down after the election quite dramatically, or not dramatically, but all of the things that they have gained now this is, is going down, but it was not homogeneous. Basically, the level of support in the middle class in the great Buenos Aires area remains more or less the same. And when I'm talking about middle class in Argentina, I'm talking about uh, incomplete high school, working class incomplete high school, uh, and university educated people of Buenos Aires City, the popularity of Macri went down almost 20 points. Uh, and in some other part of the country. So the agenda for these two publics are different. The positive thing for the government is the upper middle class voters who now are quite angry with the government because they have to pay more taxes, new tariff, uh, capital, uh, taxes on capital gains, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. They will never vote for Cristina. And it's very hardly to think that they will end up voting for a guy like Sergio Massa or other Peronists. So, the elasticity of those voters are, are quite inelastic. Uh, so unless we have someone like a spare running for president or, or these guys, uh, it's, it's quite difficult that at the end of the day, those guys, they, they lose those, those voters. Going back to Buenos Aires province, this is the map of how Buenos Aires province looked like before the 2015 election and how it ended up being in last year election. And this is huge. Because it's true that probably Mario Eugenia Vidal won because of Aníbal Fernández, but then the charismatic shock happened, and now you have the government, now you have the charisma, 
Now you have the money, uh, and now you're winning elections. Uh, and one thing is important. Buenos Aires province is as big as Spain. They had 135 local governments. Before 2015, only 15 of those 135 governments were, were out of the hands of the Peronists. Now there is half and half. 69 are uh, in hands of Cambiemos mayors. The rest of them are in hands of Peronist mayors. But last year, <laughs> Cambiemos won in more than 110 of those 135. If that's the same picture next year, that's mean that you're going to wipe out, liquidate a whole generation of Peronist uh, leaders. And why is important? Basically because in Argentina it's becoming tougher and tougher and tougher for, for a politician that does not belong from Buenos Aires City or Buenos Aires province to become national recognition or, or, or being able to run. Uh, look at all of the effort that Urtube has been made over the last few years and still he is unknown by more than one third of Argentine population. So the national candidates are coming from where the national media is and the national media only or majorly focus on Buenos Aires City and the province. The other thing is you become a mayor of any of these small municipalities or the big ones in, Buenos Aires, in the great Buenos Aires area. From a mayor you go and become a provincial deputy. From there you go and become a member of the provincial government. From there you go and become a member of the National Congress, then become a member of the national government, then become a senator, then become a chief of staff, then you become Aníbal Fernández, La Morsa. That's the story of Aníbal Fernández, but that's the story of Randazzo, that's the story of many, many Peronist leaders. So those are the minor leagues. So if next year the picture end up being like that, then a whole generation is, is why about? Mm. And that delays the recovery of the Peronist party. So that will be key. My last question is about this generational renewal that you referenced earlier, and maybe it also relates to a, a more positive vision for the future of Peronism, which is to say, is it possible that, that Macri is not reelected or has maybe one more term and the Peronists return, but they return this younger generation of more moderate Peronists that are pragmatic, that are globalists, that um, would potentially, and you'll tell me, still break the cycle. And you would say Argentina is no longer with these dramatic swings in policy, this pendulum that you described earlier, um, crisis to crisis and dramatic non-gradual approach. So is there some scenario where, you know, you obviously don't expect Christina herself to come back, where the Peronists do return, and you could still say that Argentina is in this new era? Well, we will have to see what happened with the Peronist party. Some of that process has already begun, because when you look at many of the mayors in the suburbs of Buenos Aires City, the very powerful municipalities there, over the last two or four years, but especially last in the last election, two years ago, you have many young Peronists replacing and defeating the old historic cacique Peronists that who has been in place for 35 years there. And these guys belong to a different generation. Not only there is a generational chief in the, in the leadership, there is a generational chief in the society. Telephone, 70% of Argentine people had a Facebook account. 90% of Argentine people has a cell phone or even more. The relation between the leadership and the society is becoming much more horizontal. Those old caciques talking about paternali paternalist leaders are fading away. The last campaign, you haven't seen any picture of Perón or Evita in any of the Peronist uh, candidate running. They have stopped singing the Peronist mm -hmm. march. I mean, it's, it's, they're changing. When you look at how the per politicians dress, they, how they communicate, how, and they went from one stream, from taking out the tie, mm -hmm. now Horacio, Cambie, uh, Horacio Rodriguez Larreta is always using a t-shirt, mm -hmm. and uh, not even a, a regular shirt. So it's, not, it's, it's just symbolic, but it's also that the relation between the society and the leaders. Uh, uh, and again, remember one thing, more than 50% of Argentinian voters are younger than four years old. So they don't even know, not who Perón was, who Alfonsín was. <laughs> so uh, that is changing also. Questions and kindly introduce yourself. Please. 
There's... You're fine, yeah. Okay. Oh, I take it back. You are going to need a microphone. Thanks, Ariana. Uh, Alejandro Alemán, the director of the Governance Initiative at the Perry Center for Hemispheric Defense Studies. Um, is, is there any information or insights you can offer into this administration's approach to the security and defense sector? In the following, in the following context, me llamó muchísimo la atención the comment you made that this administration is more pragmatic and managerial, less ideological, whereas for at least 10 years, if not more, the administrations took a very ideological approach to the military. Uh, so I'm wondering if you have any information uh, as to security and uh, defense sector reforms uh, possible. Sorry, I, I don't have a, a straight answer to that. I'm not, I'm not an expert in defense. Mm. Uh, what I do know is that one of the things that the administration is working, and I can, I'm not in a position to tell you if they're working with efficiency or not, but I'm in a position to tell you that public opinion believes they are doing greatly, is in the fight against uh, narco-traffic. And basically, when you ask people about the best thing that the government has done so far, the number one answer is uh, fighting corruption and, and, and getting people on, on jail and, and getting these corrupt union leaders and other people out of the picture. And secondly, or, or, or very high there, it's uh, fighting against drugs uh, in Buenos Aires province, but across the, the, the country. Uh, and last year, for example, when, when the in the first semester when the economy did not start to recover, uh, the government was very active in showing those things and pushing for that. And the people, s they, uh, they are recognizing that, and the government doesn't have any problem in campaigning using that, because th that, that is something that people believe they are doing, and they, they, they wish, and they try to, to confront uh, uh, drug dealing. From there to what happened with the military sector, or if they start using the military sector to get involved in that, I don't know. Uh, but I do believe that, especially narcotraffic, uh, not security, but narcotraffic will be one of the issues that Cambiemos will use in the next year campaign. Nicolás. Uh, thank you very much. I'm Nicolas Saldias, and I work here at the Wilson Center for the Argentina Project. And I'm looking at the uh, composition of the vote in the Provincia de Buenos Aires, and especially in the Conurbano de Buenos Aires. Um, with the decline in poverty recently that Macri has experienced, I'm wondering if we can talk about the evolution of his popularity at the bottom of the income ladder. Has he become more popular? And especially in the Conurbano de Buenos Aires, has he seen an increase in his support? And Maria Eugenia Vidal as well. Uh, as I said before, during the last... This is what happened with all of these indicators, Argentina's general situation, prospect retrospective evalu evaluation of the country, how the country is going to look like next year, Macri approval rating, government approval rating, blah, 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 blah. Macri personal popularity, Vidal personal popularity, Cristina popularity. This was the effect during the primary season. Plus nine, plus ten, plus nine, plus blah, blah, blah. This was the effect during the uh, general election season. And this was the effect during the reforms and tariff increase season. Okay? Basically, the balance, they end up almost being at the same level. And in March, things has stabilized. In April, we haven't published yet the numbers. There are some Argentinian journalists here, so I won't tell the numbers. Mm -hmm. But uh, they're not going up, and they're not remaining the same. So, <laughs> uh, so maybe at the end of April, we end up being as in the same levels as uh, the beginning of the campaign season. And as I said before, this is not homogeneous. Uh, we have seen a more dramatic 
descent in the upper middle class than in the traditional middle class. The lower class uh, is still, uh, on a majority basis, critic of Macri, but it's when you look at the last two or three years, traditionally in Argentina, Peronist candidates have very high support in the lower class. Then when you go to the middle class, the support reduce, and when you go to the upper class, the support is very low. The opposite for the radical, the opposite was for Macri in the 2015 elections. When you look at the picture nowadays, it's, it's becoming more horizontal. And in some places like Buenos Aires province, it's quite horizontal. Then you have some difference. The smallest cities are much more pro-government, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, still, the government has to deal with the stigma. Remember, Macri, every time we do a focus group and we ask people, OK, tell me something that you don't like about the government or that people doesn't like about the government. The, there is always the same thing that comes first. Macri is a rich guy. He's a member of the elite. And he runs things for the rich people. And he's out of touch of the regular John Doe. One of the biggest advantage of Mario Eugenia Vidal is that no one says that of her. No one believes she's a part of the elite, that she's a rich woman who comes from a rich family. No one believes that she runs things for her rich friends. And she's very good in showing that he is very did in touch with the real people. Okay? So that's probably the biggest advantage that Maria Eugenia Vidal has in comparison with the rest of the members of the pro party. Buenas tardes. Uh, my name is Grace Valdevit, and I'm a Georgetown student interning at the Inter-American Dialogue, which is a think tank on Latin American policy in the program for climate change and extractive industries. Uh, so not long ago, the governor from Neuquén came to our office, and he was speaking about these huge projects uh, for the development of extractive industries in that um, province. I wanted to ask you if you see any changes uh, for that sector in the next couple of years in terms of environmental or extractive industries legislation? Well, Neuquén and Vaca Muerta had a good advantage that is oil and people in Argentina, they don't openly or reject oil industry. It's, it's, it's related with IPF and how deep the tradition is there. The problem with extractive industries in Argentina is mining. Uh, and you have to go to Chubut and you have uh, Pan American Silver waiting for the last, I don't know, two, three, four years to invest more than a billion dollars there because they don't have the authorization of the Chubut governor or the, and the Chubut legislature. And money, eh, money, <laughs> uh, mining is an issue. Uh, the government will try to keep pushing, but then you have some uh, even rejection from your own members of your coalition regarding the reform in the glacier law, especially coming from Carrió. Uh, and you have some issues with a sector of the society uh, that they are concerned basically about environmental issues, specifically the uh, middle class, upper middle class, and the fact that you have uh, foreign companies coming to take our gold. This, I don't know, I don't know if it is coming from the textbook in the primary that said that the, the, sp the Spanish came and took all of the gold from Latin America, blah, blah, blah. But when the idea of foreign companies taking out the gold, it's, it's very strong. Uh, for sure, the government is pushing and, and trying to move forward with those, with extractive industry, with keep developing Vaca Muerta, uh, and try to, to push the development of mining. Uh, but then again, Macri is becoming stronger. Macri has gained a lot of political power over the last two years, but still he's uh, weak, still cambiemos 
is a weak government. Uh, um, to put it this way, they don't have the strengths or the political strengths to make the reforms or do the things they would like to do, in my opinion. Uh, still, Magri, with all of the political power he has gained over the last two years, he does not control the Congress, and he has to go and negotiate with the Peronists everything he wanted. Still, he was putting a lot of pressure in Chubut for Chubut to approve the Pan-American silver, and for the last two years, the Chubut people, or well, not the Chubut people, but the Chubut Congress said no, 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 and the former governor said no, 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 no. And there is not nothing else, much else that he can do. It's a federal country. He doesn't control the Congress. He doesn't control the majority of the governors. So it still is a long process. Patricia. Yeah, so my name is Patricia Vázquez. I am Argentina. I live here and I work on extractive industries. And so following on this question, um, Macri has um, many, many times talked about how important investments are for the country. And he, at the beginning at least, he was um, promising that there were going to be investments coming, especially in these sectors. Now, we're seeing now that investments did not come as, as fast as they told us that they were going to come. And you said at the beginning of your presentation that you have companies asking, well, is this, is it, is it now, is it going to be a different country? What, what assurances do you give us? And, and you, you presented here uh, scenarios that were, yes, m promising, but you just said, but this is not a very strong government. How important are investments for the Macri administration's success? Oof. Probably huge. Uh, I agree with you that the government had a totally different expectation of what ended up happening after they took office. I agree with you that Argentina needs many, many years of uh, stabilization and, 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 and a, a, a quiet path in order to convince people from all of the cost of our past. Uh, but Macri doesn't need a huge wave of investments in the next 12 months in order to win the election. Based on how the Peronists are doing, based in my opinion in the fact that I see very difficult that the whole Peronists get together, and even if they get together, as I explained, that will benefit the government. Uh, if nothing strange happens, uh, as a strange, I, I, as I mentioned, we don't have an international shock, we don't have a political internal shock, the chances for this administration to win the elections uh, are quite high, even without we have, I don't know, Barrick or Pan American Silver or, or Exxon saying in the next 12 months we're going to invest billions of billions of dollars in extractive uh, industry. What we are seeing, and again, we have to wait for Friday licitation, is what happened with other investment, with, with what happened with the PPPs. And I'm not an expert, but we have here some very good guys who know a lot of this. Uh, investment in Argentina is growing. Not maybe, I don't know, I don't have the number for FDI, but general investment is growing uh, and it will probably keep growing. We still are far away from the average investment rate to GDP that countries like Peru or not even Chile, but other countries in Latin America had. So, uh, in the long term, I think it will be key. But if you ask me, that is a condition for Macri to win their re-election next year? Uh, it's not. Uh, I don't think it's, it is. I think probably PPPs and many of the PPPs are direct investments, uh, foreign direct investments, uh, will be key because how successful they are on the licitaciones di this year and in the next few months will impact on the public works that will happen during the election year during the election cycle next year. 
wanted to ask about the international reinsertion of Argentina as it factors in, if at all, to public opinion. I think the conventional wisdom is that it doesn't and that foreign policy issues in general don't resonate. This has been so central, though, to the mockery image, at least as we see it, which is that this pragmatic reinsertion into the international community would contribute to a better reputation that would draw in foreign investment, but also create an image of a normal country that would be pleasing to Argentines who I don't think were comfortable seeing as pariahs interacting only with the Iranians and the Venezuelans. Um, is it as irrelevant as conventional wisdom would suggest, or is there something to hosting the G20 this year, for example, that is appealing to Argentines, seems a distraction to Argentines? It, it, does it factor in at all when you, if you ask this question or your general view of, of what Argentina and the world means domestically? I haven't asked those questions. I think it will be very clever <laughs> to ask them. I think we can work in that. Uh, my general opinion, without clear evidence, is that in, generally, in general, Argentine society doesn't care that much. We are outside the world because we are in the, by far away from the world, but because we are a very close country, I think we are one of the top 10 closest economy in the world. Uh, and in many sectors of Argentine society, for many years, there has been this saying of, Nos tenemos que arreglar con lo propio. Uh, uh, we have to survive with uh, our own resources. We don't need something else. Uh, so, of course, in, a, in some moment, especially over the last few years, the relation between Cristina Kirchner and Venezuela become a problem from a, an important sector of the society. And generally, when I'm talking about it, is the, the group in the middle, because we know what one extreme of the people think, we know the other extreme, but the important people is the 40% the of the people in the middle. And I think in a moment, the relation with Venezuela become a, an issue, a negative issue. Uh, but I'm not that sure about that Argentina society uh, is very happy or very negative about uh, Argentina reinsertion in the world. Uh, uh, I, I don't think it's 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 really going to play uh, uh, an issue. Of course, when you have someone like Obama going and visiting, um, Obama was quite popular. He was nicely seen. Generally, Argentina society looked much more to Europe than to the United States. Uh, but I don't believe it's an issue. Uh, I, I don't think it's an issue. Uh, uh, and that's a bad thing for Argentina. And I think that's one of the things that will have to change and it will take years uh, uh, to change many of the arch many of the values of, of, of the Argentine society. This will be our, our last question, but please, if there's, yeah, if you can bring my friend. I'm Mike Bosser from Department of State, uh, retired. Um, you mentioned that uh, Christina Kirchner had, had rode for a long time on the issue of human rights. And my question is, to what extent is she or other or Peronist using this politically against the Macri administration? How is Mac Macri handling that issue, coming to terms with uh, Argentine's government judicially and politically, its behavior during the, the dirty war and after? Uh, how significant is that politically now, and how is Macri handling it well or badly in your, uh, in your estimation? Well, the Kirchner, of course, are using it. And, and 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 they will not let it down. I mean, because that's one of the keys and one of the most relevant uh, and sensitive issues for a big part of the voters that the Kirchner still have. Probably one of the most strange and important thing that happened in the last two years regarding human rights is a Supreme Court decision uh, called as a dos por uno, that has the potential to favor a lot of uh, uh, military retired people who were on jail to go to and have uh, uh, prisión domiciliaria. Uh, but, and that creates just in one week a round of rejection around the whole society that on Wednesday, was the Supreme Court ruling 
over the, and that's a new evidence of how the society starts to work and how they communicate, you have a, a spontaneous round of rejection all across the society, not only from the Kishner, it was not pushed by the Kishner. Then the, the Kishners get into that. Uh, there was a massive rejection. There was a call for a big manifestation against it. Uh, the first reaction of the government was quite soft. Then during the weekend, Chief of Staff Marcos Peña went out publicly and started talking against it. On Monday, you have a special session in the Senate. On Tuesday, you have a special Senate in the Congress. They, 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 they pass a new law that did not allow the two por uno. And on Wednesday, you have a big manifestation on the streets, all in one week. Three weeks later, nobody cares or remembers about the issue. Uh, what do I mean? Still, there is a sensitive, if for many people, uh, in Argentina, still the Kishner are using that also as a way to put a stigma on the government. Not only they are rich who run things for the rich people, they belong to the right. They they are they are nice with the with the militaries, the con los represores, etc., etc., etc. And the government uh, has tried to show that uh, they are not that, uh, but it's it's not something that they will be able to use in their favor, in my opinion. They will try not to talk about it, and they will try not to open any situation who can be used by the Kishners to say, look, we were right, these guys are close to the represores, are close to the military guys, etc., etc., etc. But that's one of the issues that is very, very important for a sector of the society, and that is and has been gained by the Kishners and will keep using it in, in the next few years. Excellent. With that, please join me in thanking Alejandro Katterberg, who's very in demand here during this, the World Bank IMF meetings and was generous with sharing his time with us and his insights. So we hope he will be back sometime soon, and we'll see if all of these forecasts were okay. as accurate as the polling. Thank you, Benjamin. Okay.